just want to read two verses for your hearing, verses one and two. Bow with me in a word of prayer, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. We think of you for who you are, and we thank you for the things that you have done. And we trust that this day that you get the glory out of our gathering and out of the assembling of the body of Christ. We pray that you would add to the churches those you are saving. Forgive us of our sins, scatter them as far as the east is from the west, even drown them in the sea of forgetfulness. It's preaching time again, O oh Lord. The same old place, same old prayer. Please preside over the preaching with precision, with passion, and with power. You know the frailty of all of our frames and the fragility of our forms. So we ask, O oh God, that your partners of our guilt protect us with your goodness, provide for us with your grace, persuade us with your gospel, and pour out your gift. Make this your word believable and receivable. Make these your people receptive and responsive. O oh God, in the name of Jesus, speak to us and through us. Think with my mind and speak with my mouth. You are the real preacher. Convince, convict, and convert into the conformity of Christ. But Lord, we thank you for what you have done, and we trust you for what you're going to do. Be glorified this day, in Jesus' name, amen. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, there you shall find these words recorded for your listening as they have been translated in the English Standard Version. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. For just a little while, I'll put a tag on this text and talk on this topic today. A limited time offer. A limited time offer. Brothers and sisters, some years ago, a Saxon king who put down a rebellion in a distant province of his kingdom then placed a burning candle in the archway of his castle and announced that all who had rebelled would be spared if they put down their arms and then took an oath of loyalty to the king. But the clemency and the mercy that was offered was only limited to the life of the candle that was burning in the archway. What we know of this story is some chose mercy. Some received the clemency as it was offered. But others, my brothers and sisters, sadly enough, decided to take whatever was prescribed to them for those who wanted to remain in their rebellion. Salvation works just like that. There are those who radically accept the clemency and the mercy that is offered by God. But then there is a great delegation, far too great if you ask me, that will choose to rebel against God and not accept the offer that has been extended to them in the time that has been allotted. Most of all, in consumerism, we are familiar with limited time offers. Retailers, restaurants, and resorts and other places will offer a promotional package, will offer some free goods and services to those who respond within the time period of that offer. They say on their 
commercials and their advertisements, this is a limited time offer. And if you procrastinate, if you defer it to a later time, you might stand to lose out or to miss out on the offer that had been extended. There are many well-meaning people, I would say, that for all practical purposes, they have every intention on trusting Jesus Christ in faith for their salvation. But they procrastinated. And then life happened which prevented them from doing what they had intended to do. Our brothers and sisters, God does not want that to happen to anyone. The scripture says, God is not slack. God is not slothful, because some people count slothfulness. He's not desiring that any should perish but that all come to repentance. That's what he desires for each and every one of us. That was his desire then, that is his desire now. The Apostle Paul is faced with this kind of procrastination and even rejection and rebellion by one of the toughest churches that God gave him to tackle. That was the church of Corinth. The church of Corinth really is the book on how to pastor through any and every situation. It was Paul's most, most frustrating church. It was Paul's most challenging church simply because of the classes of individuals that were present at Corinth. Corinth was a melting pot of a metropolitan city because it existed between a maritime and a maritime trade route. It attracted people from all kinds of cultures and they liked Corinth. The weather was nice. The architecture was nice. It was an aristocratic city, and so a lot of people settled there. And when they settled there, they brought their ideologies with them. They brought their paganism with them. If they did not have a system of religion, there was religion already there for them to embrace. It was a place that was ripe for theological and evangelical picking. And so God sent him there, and he was successful in getting a church off the ground. Um, but far too many of them were carnal in their thinking. Uh, carnality don't stop you from being saved. Some would argue against that, but it will hinder your witness and your reward. And Paul was trying to get them to think with a more spiritual mindset, especially when it came to salvation. As far as the other religions were concerned, whenever you decided to become a part of it, it was all right. There were no time parameters involved. But the gospel message warns us that salvation is available while we have time. Because we, we don't know about tomorrow. Amen, somebody. The Bible warns us about boasting about tomorrow. It says, don't get up, I'm going to do this tomorrow, I'm going to go to such and such a city and buy and sell and build. He said, no, because what, what is your life? 
it's like a vapor. It is here today and gone tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised to anybody. Therefore, we cannot afford to procrastinate. But while we have our faculties, while we have the activities of our limbs, and while the blood is still running warm in our veins, those who are privileged to hear the gospel message, you ought to act on it. You ought to respond in the appropriate way because you don't know what tomorrow brings. I said on last week, I'll say it this week, in my Spock voice, live long and prosper. But if by chance this is your last sunrise, and your last sunset. The scripture says, don't let his wrath go down on you like the sun. In other words, we are admonished to seek salvation when it is offered us. Because it don't cost you anything. Jesus paid it all. It doesn't take a lot of time. And those of you who have made certain purchases knew the time it took for you to make that purchase. When you bought your house, it was a long process to purchase. You had to look for it, and once you found it, you had to make an offer. Am I right about it? And after your offer was found to be acceptable, then you had to file or petition a lender to loan you the money for the house. Unless you're financially independent, that is. And that took a process, and every time you called your banker, they told you, just be patient. It's in underwriting. And all of us wonder, what in the world do they do in underwriting that takes so long? But then you get that call and say, all right, now, your loan has been approved and your loan has been underwritten and now you got to go to the closing and when you go to the closing that takes two hours because they try to summarize all of the many forms that you got to fill out in order to complete that purchase I see your new car in the lot when you went to the dealership it wasn't just a drop in the bucket, a walk in the park. You spent some time with the salesman, with the finance office, haggling and debating about getting the best deal and the best bang for your buck. And then when your decision was final, it took a little while for everything to go through so that you could secure the vehicle. And like the house and like the vehicle, you still had to pay for it. Amen, somebody. According to the terms that the lender extended to you. And if you def go default on those terms, they have the right to repossess the property because you really don't own it free and clear. You're purchasing it with the aspiration of one day owning it and it's been paid in full. Okay, you don't have a house. You don't have a car. Many of you have a cell phone. And no matter who your carrier is, it takes half a day to get a cell phone. Almost as long as it does to get a car or a house. And after you select the device that you want, the plan that you want, there's a whole lot of things that you got to deliberate along with your service provider before you walk away with your shiny new phone. But if you don't pay the phone bill, 
You're going to go to use that phone. Make a call. Send a message. And you will find out that it's been disconnected. Now, whether it's the phone, whether it's the car, whether it's the house, if in time you are able to make satisfactory arrangements with them, uh, they will restore your service or they will call off the creditors from repossessing the property. Aren't you glad salvation doesn't work like that? My point is, it doesn't take a lot of time. The old people say it like this, it's quicker than right now, and it's sooner than after a while. And God is faithful. You don't have to worry about him revoking it. You don't have to worry about him recalling it. You don't have to worry about him repossessing your salvation. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminianist, once you're saved for real, you're really saved. And no man really has that level of discernment to see if a person is saved or not. Some people think they do, but they don't. And the ones that think they do, they may not be saved themselves. I can tell you if everybody else saved or not. But they don't act like they're saved all the time either. Y'all gonna help me today. And so that's what we ought to love about God. I said a little while ago, we have been extended the privilege to hear the gospel. That means before the foundation of the world, you have been predestined to hear the gospel. And God knows who will be saved. God knows who will accept or either reject the message of the gospel. And God is faithful and God is fair. No one will be able to stand in the judgment and to call God to the carpet and say, you didn't give me enough time because all God is going to do is he's going to turn his fire stick on and then he's going to demand some of the program of your life and he will show you every time that he tried to save you every conversation Every event, every activity, every time someone witnessed to you, every time you went to church and when they extended the invitation to discipleship, you'll see yourself declining. And the unfortunate thing, the thing that breaks my heart the very most, I tell this in my Bible class, that some people will find condemnation through the venue of organized religion. Now that's saying a mouthful, but let's move all the other false religions out the way and single out the church. Some people will still find condemnation who have been to church. And I'm not talking about church where you go for all the fanaticism and all the fluff. I'm talking about a Bible-loving, Bible-learning, Bible-living church, a church that teaches good and sound doctrine. It is as if that they will just sit there 
and allow the truth of God to go in one ear and out the other. I guess next week, Dr. W.T. Klein has a saying that some people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. Because it is said that the distance between an average man's brain and heart is 18 inches. Because some people will try to reconcile salvation in their head. When God wasn't aiming for your head, his target was your heart. Because even for some scholars, this whole thing about salvation is mind-blowing. It's baffling. It's a conundrum. No one can really understand it. I think I heard someone say it earlier that all of this is from God. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate to the church at Corinth. He's trying to discuss with them what faithful partnership and participation is in response to the gospel. In chapter 5, he had already dealt with the fact that believers are redeemed in Christ. They are reconciled in Christ. And they have been recreated in Christ. Having said this, he admonishes the child of God to focus their attention on considering what remains in the process of pragmatics. And that is the getting down to business, closing the deal. That's the process. The car with the house with the phone. You close the deal after you got down to the business. We must remember that all who are saved have been so because we have acted on what we believed. This is what he tells the Roman church, chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, where he says, how can they call on him of whom they have not believed? How can they believe in whom that they have not heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach except they have been sent. Paul goes on to say, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel, bring glad tidings to the poor. But he also says, but they all have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah puts it this way, who has believed our report? So then he says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. One's behavior is therefore a consequence of what one believes. If you've been born again, your behavior pretty much indicates that you believe. And what you heard, you didn't have the, men, the Missouri mentality. I got to see it before I believe it. You were not what scholars call an empiricist. An empiricist is someone who can only accept something based on his or her ability to understand. If you're sitting around trying to figure God out, good luck and best of wishes. You ain't going to never figure God out. Isaiah said that in chapter 40. He, he said about God that he, there's no searching of his understanding. If you want to worship a God, if you want to serve a God, you can figure out he must not be a very good God. As you're two steps ahead of him 
at all times. You need to tell him what to do to manage the affairs of your life. He's not a very good God then, is he? But, oh, my brothers and sisters, the wisdom of God is unequaled and unparalleled. And what is foolishness to some in the preaching of the cross, it has been proven to be the wisdom of God on our behalf. And we were just crazy enough to act on what we believed, not completely understanding all of the features, all of the parameters, the ins and the outs, not picking apart the details, but just believing that God loved me enough that he would give his son to share and to shed his life and his blood for us. Salvation is a processed path of steps and stages that commenced for the believer at Calvary. If you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross at Calvary, you are not saved. Amen, somebody. In my Maury Povich voice, the lie detector determined that was a lie. Because there is no way to be saved apart from Jesus Christ. I know you may be devoted to whatever you're devoted to, but the Bible says there is no salvation given among men other than the salvation that is in the name of Jesus. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all work together in the agreement in salvation. Jesus talks about the Father. He said, you, nobody can come to me except the Father draw him. Jesus says, nobody can get to the Father except they come through me. And nobody realizes they need salvation unless the Holy Spirit is is not doing his job, which is to convict the world of sin. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all working on our behalf in salvation, leading us through those steps and those stages that commenced at Calvary, whereby the words of the litany ring true. Living, he loved me. Dying, he loved me me. Buried he carried my sins far away but rising he justified freely and forever and one day he's coming back. Oh what a glorious day. Will you be ready when Jesus comes? Let me fix it for you. I didn't say if Jesus comes. Because he said he's coming. He says, hold on and hold out, y'all. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And when I return, when I come back, I will receive you again unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Touch your neighbor. You better tell him he's coming back. I don't know how you feel about it, but I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Sign me up for the Christian Jubilee. Write my name on the road. It wasn't me. It wasn't the psychologist. It wasn't the sociologist. I've been changed since the Lord has lifted me. And I want to be ready when Jesus comes. But listen, let me help you. You may not be right when Jesus comes. 
as the standards of some are, but you better be ready. You just miss your shout. Because in the eyes of some, you say, but you may not be right. Hallelujah, somebody. But all God wants us to be is ready. Because any righteousness that we have, it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come intrinsically. Nobody can hand it down to you as an heirloom. Any righteousness that we have, it comes from God. God is no respecter of any person. He don't care how pretty you are. He don't care how tall you are. He don't care how smart you are. Doesn't care how wealthy you are, how talented you are. He's no respecter of any person because he knows that all of us came into this world under the same curse and headed for the same condemnation. But when we went to Calvary, our GPS said recalculating. Have you ever used your GPS and you made a wrong turn? The GPS was smart enough to, to recalculate. It knows how to get you where you are going even if you make a wrong turn. When you met God at Calvary, that wasn't a wrong turn. That was a right turn. You were on your way to a devil's hell. But at the cross, when I first saw the light, at the cross, where the burdens of my heart rolled away, at the cross, where I received my sight, it was there I heard recalculate. Because now I'm on my way to heaven. And I'm so glad. It's steps and it's stages. And the first set of steps, we approach the cross to be saved. And then the second set of steps, we are sent from the cross to serve. In our approach to the cross, and this is everybody. In case you think yourself above measure, the Bible commands not to think more highly of yourself than we ought to think. And some of that break that commandment every day. We approached the cross. We were empty and burdened. You were empty. You were dead on the inside. You are the walking dead, spiritually dead, bankrupt of the Spirit's power. But since you've been to Calvary, you are full and you are free. Now you just missed your, where, where, where I'm at, your fourth shout by now. Rather you mean to tell me when I met Jesus I was empty? But I was burdened down. But since I met Jesus, I am full. And now I'm free. I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. And that's a blessing. Anybody here want to praise the Lord? And shout hallelujah. I'm free. In these steps and in these stages leading 
from Calvary. There are many things, but three of those things are major principles. What we receive from God, first of all, is justification. Hallelujah, somebody. Justification is received upon the confession of faith. Justification alters our spiritual condition. In other words, it is God imputing the righteousness of Jesus upon us. I tell you, we have no righteousness on our own. There's nothing that we could do. There's nothing that we could say to appear righteous before God. It's all about God and none about us. It's as if I traded sport coats with Reverend Treadwell here. He's a big fella, isn't he? My sport coat wouldn't fit him. And his sport coat wouldn't fit me. But that is really the pictorial illustration of how imputation works. I'll be the bad one. I'm unrighteous. And if I put this on him, it will be uncomfortable. It would be restricting. But if I put his coat on me, it would be too big. It would be oversized. And whether or not I would be ever to, able to grow into it would be dubious to even suggest. So it is with our spiritual imputation. Jesus when he became sin on the cross, it was uncomfortable. It was constricting. It wasn't a good look. It was unfashionable for Jesus. But when he put his righteousness on me, it is something that each and every day that we have to try to grow into. Hallelujah, somebody. Because how many believe today that his righteousness is too big for us to understand or even for us to comprehend? Paul talked about that. The Roman church, he says in chapter 5, verse 1, justified by our faith. Here comes your shout. Now we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That is what justification brings. It brings peace with God. We have an altered spiritual condition. We have been declared righteous by God. Then there's sanctification. Sanctification is received upon our condition of faith. Because God has dealt to each man a measure of faith. Raise your hand if you play cards. You don't go to hell for playing cards. <laughs> 29 more hands went up. Raise your hand. If you play cards, whatever card game that you indulge in, your success in the game is determined by the hand that you've been dealt. Come on, spades players. Come on, bids, whist players. Uno players, whatever you play. Poker players. Is determined on the hand you've been dealt. That's how a measure of faith works. But do you not know with God, God redeals your hand. 
What, what you talking about, Reverend, in your Todd Bridges voice? I hear you. Card players, you've been playing long enough. You've played a time or two. Where? Because somebody wasn't paying attention. They misdealed. And because they misdealed, it revolved to the next person. Hallelujah, somebody. God knew that in our conception, there was a misdeal. Amen, somebody. He knew that we all had a bad hand when it comes to faith. And with the little faith you had, when you looked at that hand and you counted those cards in life, you got one too, too short or one too many. Misdeal. And when you confessed your condition of faith to God, he dealt you a new hand. Hallelujah, somebody. Tell a neighbor, I got a new hand. Thank you, Jesus. And because you've been dealt a new hand, now, through sanctification, you're headed in a different direction. Oh, bless the name of God. Sanctification means that you have been set apart. You're in the world, but as a Christian, don't be of the world. Jesus said to his apostles when he sent them out on a missionary journey, he said, I'm going to send you out as sheep among wolves. I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Don't you feel like that sometimes? Yeah. That you are sheep among a bunch of wolves. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Amen. But do you not know that God takes care of his sheep? Yeah. Even when we find ourselves in a pack of rapacious wolves, he helps us. And do you not know that his eye is on the sparrow? Nothing is insignificant to God. And if his eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. Hallelujah, somebody. I've been set apart. When he saved me, sanctification means I'm going to sit you over here because I plan to use you later whenever I choose. That's what sanctification is all about. He sets you apart so he can use you. You sanctify things all the time. We make sanctification charismatic. We make it Pentecostal. Yeah. Any born again believer yeah. is sanctified. Uh -huh. God has set you apart for himself. Yeah. You sanctify money. You save it so you can use it later. You sanctify food. When you went out to the restaurant, the server asked you, you done? You need a container? You said yes. Because that food was good. It was expensive. And you didn't want it to go to waste. But you were full at that moment. And so you took the container. And when you got ready for it again, you zapped it in the microwave for a few minutes. And you picked up where you left off. You sanctify things all the time. So why can't God sanctify for his own ends and his own purposes? It's not for us to decide what we will do for God. God decides what we will do for him. Jude says we're sanctified in 
chapter 1, verse 1, he says, To them who are called, who have been loved by God the, fa the Father, and kept by the power of Jesus Christ. That word kept out of the original language is their word for sanctify. You just missed your, where we at now, seventh shout. <laughs> to be sanctified means that he kept you. You, you, you're not there. You, you didn't start thinking. Some of y'all should be stark raving mad because of some terrible atrocities that have occurred in your life. But he kept your mind. Some of you could have been in the deep, dark throes of depression because of all of the heartache that you experienced in your life. But he kept your heart. Don't give the doctor all the credit now. Some of us should have been dead a long time ago. But God said it's not time yet. He kept your life. Don't tell me he's not a keeper. He'll sanctify you. He will keep you so that he can use you at his discretion. Then that third major theme is glorification. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Glorification is received upon our consummation of faith. When you've been regenerated and you've been born again, you have already been positioned for a final outcome that is unequaled or unrivaled. A lot of times we use scriptures for the wrong reasons. In this book, Paul makes a declaration in chapter 9. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the hearts of men, the great thing that God has in store for those who love him. That's talking about heaven, y'all. God's going to blow your mind, your eyes and your ears when you get to heaven. You haven't seen anything yet. This is certainly not the best that God can do. All he has to offer when we get to heaven. Every day is going to be hello. Every day is going to be Hallelujah. Let me go OG preacher on you. The wicked will cease from their troubling. And the weary will be at rest. There will be no more tear-stained eyes. And mournful cries. Mahalia sang it like this. Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world and I'm going home to be with the Lord where it will be better John said it would be better in 1 John 3 and 2 he says beloved and this is what shouts me we're on number 9 now don't miss your shout <laughs> beloved we are the children of God now Look at that when you get home. King James Version says, Beloved, now we are the, the sons of God. But the ESV says, We are the children of God now. But like a good infomercial, he says, But wait, there's more. It doesn't yet appear 
what we are going to be. Because when he appears, we're not only going to see him as he is, we're going to be like him. That sounds pretty good. See, I'm comfortable in my own skin to know that I'm not all I'm cracked up to be. I'm transparent with myself enough to know that God is not through with me yet. In some regards, I ain't what I used to be. I'm being transparent. In some regards, I ain't what I ought to be, but I'm excited because I'm not yet what I'm going to be. Hallelujah, somebody. If you won't be transparent, let me be transparent. When I see him, wait, there's more. I shall be like him. Glorification is the final outcome. Amen, somebody. That's when God makes us the very best that we can be. And so, I'm not going to push it, just going to drop it. But there are timeless truths trapped within the treasure of this text that are tailored to teach us to take advantage of the opportunity of a lifetime. Because it is only offered during the lifetime of the opportunity. That leads me to my first point. We have a limited time to receive. Just a limited time to receive. Paul says, working together with him, then we appeal for you to not Receive the grace of God in vain. This is the mandate of this message. That word vain means without result. There may be somebody here under the sound of my voice, I don't know, who have heard the gospel, heard the good news, and there have been no results. It is not because of God that there are no results. It is because of us. I said it earlier about those characters in that Saxon kingdom. It's the rebellion in our hearts to resist the very plan of God reason why we don't have results and what we do often is because we rebel against the grace of God. That's one of the greatest things about grace is God's riches, God's rewards, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. One of the things I dislike about grace is that it can be rejected by anyone it's extended to. So Paul warns, he said, this is a limited time offer. And the offer is only good during the lifetime of its opportunity. He had already set them up for these two verses. Back in chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. The new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting to us 
the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And then he says, working together with him. Then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Years ago, USA Today had an article on the front page about those who had escaped the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. After interviewing over 300 survivors and family members of victims, USA Today concluded that in the South Tower, those who didn't delay but ran for safety immediately are the ones who survived. Those who delayed are the ones who perished. It occurred to me that the spiritual life is much the same as that of those who delay and put off a commitment to Jesus Christ often wait until it's too late. USA Today also noted that people lived or died in the towers by groups. Influenced to stay or go, listen, by people around them. The same is true spiritually. That people are often influenced to seek Christ or reject Christ. This is the character of your witness. By those around them. If there's ever a time for courage, it's in responding to God's call. Those who didn't delay and who took a stand are those who survived the World Trade Center. Those who don't delay and take a stand spiritually are those who respond to God's calling and are saved. Don't delay. Don't delay. It's a limited time to be received. But then, it's a limited time to be reconciled. He says, for he says in Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 8, by the way, in a favorable time, I listen to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. This is the memorandum of this message. Paul's quotation of Isaiah 49 and 8 was a rebuttal to the Judaizers in Corinth who wanted to impose the Mosaic law as a means of obtaining righteousness. You can be a Christian just under J Jewish terms. In Isaiah, God announced that salvation would be universally offered not to only stubborn Israel, but also to the Gentiles as well. It was a prophecy about a day of salvation coming for all people through Jesus. The quotation here underscored the fact that salvation is God's initiative. Amen. It's not my initiative. It's not the preacher's initiative. It is God's initiative. Jesus inaugurated this message of grace in his message in that synagogue in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, which we'll share with you in just a minute. And Paul communicated and perpetuated that message, even here, as we'll see later, to the church at Corinth. The day of salvation is what we call the present age of grace. Friends, we are in the present age of grace. When the rapture comes, the present age of grace is over. Hallelujah, somebody. God's moving on to something else. 
Aren't you glad that you received him in this present age of grace? Paul then urges the Corinthians not to spurn that grace by turning to Judaistic legalism. All the Judaizers are not dead. And they certainly weren't all in Corinth. There are some postmodern Christians who are really Judaizers. They try to impose some form of legalism on Christians as a means of their salvation. Do something. Dress in something. Don't do something. Don't wear something. If, you, if you, you're not saved, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved, if you don't do this. and all. They make all of these legalistic impositions on people as if to say Jesus was not enough. Again, I revisit, there's nothing that you can add to salvation to make it any more effective. Jesus, when he began his public ministry, he stepped into a synagogue one day, and it was his turn to read the scripture. And he opened the scroll of Isaiah, and he found the place where it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That was Jesus' M.O. to his ministry. He told Nicodemus, at night, God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him, listen, should not perish. And in your personal studies and meditation, you, you, you should really look at that, should not. Should not. Amen, somebody. Amen. Because when it's done right, it works. Don't be one of those people when it comes to salvation. Do, do it with something else. Don't be one of those people to do your version of God's stuff. Do it with something else. Don't do it with salvation because, you know, some of us are hard-headed. And we find it difficult to do stuff the way it's supposed to be done. Pick something else in the Bible to not get right. As far as getting saved, make sure you've done that right. How do you do it? How do you do it? You get over yourself and you cooperate with God in these matters. We should not perish but have everlasting life. Why? We, we harp on John 3.16 a lot, but we need to look at John 3.17 a little more. The reason why Jesus came in the first place. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word saved is used in John 10 and 9. After he healed the man that was born blind and the church folk, the religious establishment went crazy because of the miracle that happened to the man. And then Jesus had to give them a long discourse telling them, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastors. That word saved here and that word saved in John 3 means uh, delivered, safe, and sound. It was normally used to say that a person had recovered from a severe illness, which we have, yes. come through a bad storm, yes. which we have, yes. survived a war, which we have, yes. and have been acquitted in a court of law, which we have. Yes. Some modern preachers don't like to use that old-fashioned terminology like save, but I want to stand here today and tell God, thank you. He saved me. I'm not going to stand and say I've been reformed. Mm -mm. I've been saved. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why every chance I get, I feel like the psalmist when he said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases. That's the spiritual stuff. Who redeems your life from the pit. He snatched you literally, literally from the pit of hell. And who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. A mercy that never fails. A mercy that never fades. He says, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Hmm, that's something to think about. Ray Stetman says it like this about the ministry of reconciliation. It originates with God, not man. It is personally experienced. It is universally inclusive. It is without condemnation. It is delivered by men. It is owned and accredited by God. It is voluntarily accepted. And it achieves what otherwise is impossible. And it is experienced by people moment by moment. My, my, my. A pastor was dealing with a young lady who was a frequent attender, let's call her. And he was, she was arguing with him, trying to convince the pastor that she had plenty of time to decide for Jesus Christ. He handed her a piece of paper and said, okay, through wisdom, he said, would you sign a statement that you would be willing to postpone salvation for a year? No. She said, I'm not going to do that. Well, would you sign a paper that you would postpone salvation for six months? Again, she says, no. He says, okay, how about one month? Hesitating, however, she said no. Then she began to see the folly of her own argument because she had only the assurance of accepting the opportunity for that particular day. For those who hear the message here present among us, out on social media, in the airways, on the World Wide Web, you only have today. And after reconciling that in her own mind, she trusted Christ that very day because she realized it was a limited time to be reconciled. But then lastly, we have a limited time to respond. Working together with them. Then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of Christ in vain for it says in a favorable time I listened to you and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is the motivation in the message. Look at what the unnamed and unwriter, unknown writer of Hebrews says in chapter 3, verse 7 through 19. It's lengthy, but it's necessary. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another 
every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. To reject the gospel simply means that you don't believe God. You don't believe that it works. You hear me urging almost every Sunday out of Isaiah 55, 6 through 7, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts. And let him turn to the Lord and he will have compassion upon him and to our God. And he will abundantly pardon. How many know that he will abundantly pardon? The preacher talks about a story that he sent two of his soul winners out, evangelism team, two young ladies, and they went out soul witnessing as they approached a large yellow house in the neighborhood, kind of quaint house with burgundy shades. They noticed a ramp leading up to the front door. It led to a large porch with a swinging gate. And when they knocked on the door, a kindly woman in her late 40s greeted them very warmly. She thanked the ladies for visiting, but explained that with all the company that she had that day, it would actually be better if the pastor himself could come by and pay them a visit. And so she explained that her mother was a bedridden invalid and was not saved and had a prognosis of advanced stages of cancer. So on Tuesday, the pastor visited only to find out that Ruby, the mother's name, had experienced a bad day. And some of you know who have been sick or care for someone who's been sick. Sometimes they have bad days and can't receive visitors. The preacher assured the daughter that he would be glad to come at any other time and wrote his home number on the back of a track. And upon a further examination, the minister learned that the mother had less than one month to live. He says, I will never forget the words that her daughter expressed. She said, you would think that when you get this close to the end of your life, you would make sure that you get eternal things settled. That, my friend, is the devil's great deception. Do it, but do it tomorrow. Satan knows for some that you got every intention to do it, but if he could just convince you to wait till tomorrow, you're one day closer, one step closer to condemnation. Perhaps that's why God's word says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the day of salvation. Paul goes on and he appeals to them. He appeals to their sensitivities. Paul removes the veneers. He unzips the body bag. He comes out of the closet he, dis he bears all to them, telling them about his trials. In verses 3 through 5, he says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger. 
appeals to their sensitivities by his tools. He's, verses 6 through 7 says, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and by the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. He appealed to their sensitivities through his testimony. Verses 8 through 11 says, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true, unknown and yet well known, dying and behold we live as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Time is filled with swift transition. Not of earth, unmoved can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. And hold on to God's unchanging hand. Covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures. They will never pass away. Trust in him who will not leave you whatsoever years may bring. And if by earthly friends forsaken, still more closer to him cling. And when your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, fair and bright the home and glory, your enraptured soul will view. Hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. And hold on to God's unchanging hand. Be not dismayed. Whatever be tired. God will take care of you. We extend the invitation to discipleship. There may be someone under the sound of my voice present among us today by invitation or by curiosity. You were guided to be a part of our worship service here today. God wanted you to hear the message because he is God. He knew what the message would be. He knew that the message would be tailored in order to teach you to accept oh so great a salvation to no longer take God for granted to no longer receive the grace of God in vain but to actively respond today today if you hear his voice do not harden your heart for somebody listening, so for somebody watching, today, today. is the day of salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is our prayer that you do it today. Okay. Let us pray. God, be thanked and be praised. Thank you for these worshipers. Thank you for your word. We pray that not a word of yours return to you void but accomplish what you please oh god add to the body of christ such as should be saved lord god reveal your precious and priceless promise that says whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved do it for your glory god even through stubbornness 
you've given them a measure of faith. Yes. 